attention to the uh, cover of our feast booklet. As I look at that this afternoon, I, a few scriptures come to my mind. And what you see here is an individual with his hands lifted up. And uh, some scriptures come to my mind, one of which is uh, what we have here. Lift up your hands to the sanctuary or in the sanctuary and bless Yahweh. In the book of Psalms, you will read that praise is coming for the upright. You will read that praise awaits you, O Yahweh, in Zion. You will also read that with my hands I lift up my heart unto Yahweh. All those are befitting of praise. Uh, and then you will read also that Yahweh inhabits praise of his people. So does he delight? Yeah, he delights in praise. Does it accrue to our benefit? Yes, it accrues to our benefit. If he inhabits our praise, we, that's a good time to make your petitions known unto him. Yes, and that is when you are lifting up your hands, lifting up your heart with your hands, you see, because then at that point you have his undivided attention. Uh, personally, uh, you know, I guess Every word expositor has a, has a message. You know, you can read the, the Nevi'im, the prophets, and there's a recurring theme. Like, for example, when you read Jeremiah, there is a recurring theme. Ezekiel, there's a recurring theme. Isaiah, there's a recurring theme. Basically, it is simply repent. You know, repent, repent. We find a cyclical message in the book of Judges, for example. Isn't that interesting? This chapter he read, Brother Lucas read, I was thinking, he's like a Peyton place. I mean, the book of Judges is just replete with narrative after narrative. And one might say, why is all that included in the scripture? Well, my own judgment and assessment is that it's in there because we need to learn from it. You know, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Man is just basically evil. Contrary to what the world tells you, that man is basically good, there's nothing good in flesh, period, you see. We all have a need to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. We have a need to be transformed out of this world. We have a need to be conformed into the image of Messiah. That's the restitution of all things that the scripture speaks about in the Acts of the Apostles. It's the, the reformation that the scripture is speaking about in Hebrews chapter 9 to be conformed into the image of our Master, who became a curse. Remember last Sabbath, I talked about this mutual exchange? I don't know about you, but that meant something to me. When I exegeted that word, you know, Yom, I said last Sabbath, Yom Kippur, you know, when I exegeted that word, Kippur, and discovered that it, it refers to a mutual exchange. Atonement refers to a mutual exchange. We are exchanging our sins for his grace and he in turn receives of our sins that he may impart unto us his grace it's a mystery you know you get so deep in the word of Yahweh that you know you run out of vocabulary you know what I'm talking about and particularly when you begin to try to even converse with one that doesn't have the understanding that you have and you discover I don't know what more to say I don't even know how to frame my words properly in fact, you'll discover that even when you're speaking to Yahweh in prayer, in intercession, I find this myself. You know, you think, you know, you're approaching the throne of grace. Aren't you glad that he knows our thoughts, even from afar off? He knows what's in our heart, even if you find it so inexpressible that you cannot communicate unto the king, the sovereign of the universe. I mean, sometimes when I go to pray, and, and no doubt you have the same experience, you just have to stop it. What am I saying? What can I say to him? You know? So I appreciate scriptures. All things are naked and open unto him. You know, Yeshua himself says that, you know, your father knows what you have need of even before you ask him. And it's his good pleasure to give us the kingdom. Hallelujah. So I get thinking about the Feast of Tabernacles. And I thought about it this afternoon as I was looking over my notes and even scribbled some stuff down here. 
One of the things that we should cultivate and nurture in the Feast of Tabernacles, as well as every time we come together in Holy Convocation, in Solemn Assembly, and that, by the way, is what we are supposed to do, commanded to do in Leviticus chapter 23. You know, it starts out in the first three verses. These are my holy convocations. And then he gives a whole list, a whole summary of them. Holy convocations coming together, set apart from all that is the rest of the world. And I got to thinking, well, what is the purpose of coming together? Well, there's so many scriptures dealing with, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We're going to be dwelling together, right? For a week. Hopefully we won't get on each other's nerves. Hopefully we won't <laughs> get under each other's skin. That's not been my experience in the last 12 Feasts of Tabernacles that I've, that I've been a part of. It's been a wonderful and joyous experience, you know. My wife and I, we were going to go to Montana last last month and uh, decided that, well, it's just too far and don't think I could handle the drive and so forth and so on. And so this is our annual vacation. And we know there are a lot of people who schedule their annual vacations for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Sukkot. It's a wonderful time. You know, I wouldn't rather be with anybody else than with the family of Yahweh, where we can cultivate and nurture the very thing that we are here to do, and that is to come into a oneness of mind and speech and judgment. To behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in the unity of the Spirit and in the bond of peace. After all, the Scripture says, how can two walk together except to be agreed? How can it even an assembly walk one with one, one with another, except it be in agreement? You know, I mean, that's the way a marriage works too, right? A marriage works when we work. And you certainly have to work in a marriage, you know, if it's going to, if it's going to survive. Well, I just want to use, uh, give you some of this uh, by way of introduction. Uh, uh, the next five messages, because I'll be speaking five times, and won't be the next five, because... Elder Tom's going to be speaking, Elder David will be speaking, so you get a little bit of a respite from listening to me. But I, some time ago, I addressed myself, there are 10 ways to kill a church. I, I come across this back in July of 1997. I don't even remember where I got it, but I've been collecting stuff like this for many, many years. And since that time, I've expanded it because I've seen some other things that have occurred too, not only just in Seventh-day Assemblies, but particularly even, even in the church. And that's where it all started. So I'm going to read a scripture to you here in a moment from the Acts of the Apostles. My message should be very long. I mean, at least it's only five pages long, and I'm only going to read about four. Uh, at the end of which, I have a handout. If you desire to have it, you may. If you don't want, that's all right, too. Sixteen ways to kill an assembly. I had originally titled this, Sixteen Ways to Ensure That Your Boat Stays Afloat. So you can take it either way. I mean, these are going to sound kind of negative, and they are negative, you know. But I want to read something to you from the Acts of the Apostles, from Acts chapter 27, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but that's all right. It's my message, right? It's what Yahweh gives me, so I'm going to read this to you. If you turn with me to Acts chapter 27, we'll start there. Just to set the stage, the Apostle, the Shalak Shaul, he is on board a ship. But 275 other mariners, I say mariners, I mean they were all together, some were sailors or mariners, most of them were prisoners, and of course there was an entourage of Roman soldiers as well. Shaul had appealed unto Caesar, and now unto Caesar he would be going. But it's an interesting narrative, because you're going to see some things in here that, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I want to get right to the nitty gritty of it, but I Gotta wait. Because it's really the theme of what I'm going to be speaking about these next five times. One little verse in the last verse that I'll be reading. Let's begin with Acts chapter 27, verse 9. Now, when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. Let me just speak about that. The fast was already passed. We get there a sense that this must have occurred in the late fall of the year or mid-fall of the year around the Day of Atonement. 
But if you look at commentaries, they'll tell you that's just about what that means. But it means something else in terms of uh, maritime shipping. In fact, we're going to read a little bit here. It was winter time when shipping was very, very dangerous. You know, they had sails on their ships, right? They didn't, they, their ships were not nuclear powered. They didn't run on diesel engines or anything like that. They depended upon the wind. And in these, in this, this setting, we find that the winds were very, very contrary. We're going to read that, about that in a moment. And so when it talks about the fast was passed, that is, in ter that's a maritime term as well. So it's not just referring to the Day of Atonement, perhaps, but perhaps even more in terms where navigation was extremely, not very commodious at all. Verse 10, So Shaul said unto them, Sirs, I perceive this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Shaul. And after all, he was a prisoner, right? You know, who, whose word are you going to take? The captain of the vessel or some guy that on his way to be beheaded. And actually, that's, well, he wasn't going to be beheaded right away, but ultimately he would be. Verse 12, And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart, if by any means they might attain to Phenice and there to winter, which is in haven of Crete, and lies toward the southwest and northwest. Now we're in the Mediterranean Sea, that's where we're at. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurycliden. I'm going to tell you a little story about this. Back in December of 1979, I believe it was, I was pastoring two Methodist churches down in Shannon County, Missouri. And, uh, you know, they had a, a preacher's Christmas service. And this was held at Licking, Missouri. And there was a young man that I had kind of mentored. He was a Nazarene pastor, but they were closing his church. And they met the Methodist General Conference needed a pastor down in Birch Street, Missouri. So I recommended Bill Ogden, and they accepted his uh, Nazarene credentials and so forth. And he put us all to shame. Because, you know, I'm not much, I'll just say, I am not much for Bible trivia. I don't play Bible trivia games, and there's a reason for that. And I'll just tell you what the reason is. This book is a set-apart covenant that we have with Yahweh. And I don't, personally, I don't believe that we ought to be making something trivial out of something that is of such a serious and grave nature. Now, that's just John Reese talking. So I don't play Bible trivia games. Because to me, it's, uh, you know, it's, it kind of demeans the character of our, so of, of our Solomon Father. That's me. Do whatever you want, but I don't play trivia games. But anyway, and so they had this Bible trivia game. And so this word, your Clyden, come up. And guess who knew, you know, the, the, the question had to do with, what was the name of this tempestuous wind that we find in the book of the Acts of the Apostles? It didn't even refer to the address. Well, I didn't know. No one else knew except this Nazarene preacher. And he showed us up. There's about 30 of us together. You know, we were all embarrassed and ashamed, particularly those who had MDiv degrees from seminary. Because it's something that you would suppose that, you know, a professional reverend would have known. Not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurycliden. Verse 15. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clonin, we had much work to come by the boat. Which... When they had taken up, they used helps, undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, they struck sail and so were driven, and we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest the next day, they lightened the ship, 
and the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after a long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, I told you so. You should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the Malik of Elwa, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, O thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, Elwa hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Let me just share, share with you for a moment how things develop in Yahweh's economies. Turn with me to Acts chapter 9 for a moment. Now, the apostle, the Shalak, so he didn't plan any of this. It just happened. You know, Yahweh, through his word and through his prophets, will speak a word foretelling something as well as telling forth. That's the, that is the ministry of a prophet. In Acts chapter 9, we have the narrative and the account of Shaul having an encounter with Yeshua, the kind of an encounter, by the way, that we don't want to have, okay? <laughs> you know, being fallen to our face and seeing this bright light for but a moment and then being struck blind and having to be led by the hand into the city. All part of Yahweh's plan. But the point I want to get to is something that Yeshua spoke unto his trusted disciple Ananias that comes to pass right here. In Acts chapter 9, after the Master had spoken to Ananias that this man, Shaul, who had come to the city for the purpose of of finding them of this way, of the sect of the Nazarene, whom ever he found to bring them back to Jerusalem to stand in the, and before a kangaroo court and be judged and be sentenced. And naturally, they were quaking in their sandals because they knew Ananias. He, he actually was bold and audacious enough to speak back to the master. We've heard very much about this man, Joel, and he's come here for that purpose, that if he found any of the sect of the Nazarene, to bring them back to Jerusalem to stand before the Sanhedrin. And notice what Yeshua says to him. Verse 15. The master said to him, Go your way, for he is a chosen vessel to me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now that's prophetic too. Because of Shaul's own testimony in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he speaks about all the perils that he experienced. All part of Yahweh's doing, by the way. But what I'm saying to you here is that Shaul was on his way to appear before Nero. Two times he appeared before Nero, the Caesar. He was a very wicked man, by the way. And so this is what, what he's doing. This is the thing. See, Yahweh intended that this man should bear his name before king, before civil authority. And so Shaul was fulfilling a prophecy. Did Ananias tell him these? I don't know if Ananias told him what, what's going to, what lay ahead of him. I don't know anything about that. The scriptures are silent. What I'm saying to you, though, is that Yahweh's word does not return to him void. It will definitely accomplish the purpose whereto it is sent. And we sometimes are just like pawns in the hands of an almighty Elohim who's going to be sure and certain that whatever he has decreed is going to come to pass. In fact, there's a scripture in Isaiah that says, that which is determined shall be done. That which Yahweh determines and decrees, it's a guarantee it's going to be accomplished. No man is going to be able to resist it. No man is going to be able to withstand it. Yahweh's will will be done. 
And it may not be done the way we think it will be done. But one thing that I'm confident of, and I've had enough experience, and you do have had enough experience in dealing with him, is that it is a perfect, completed work. It's just the way he does. He doesn't leave any loose ends. Man does that. But Yahweh doesn't leave any loose ends. And that's why we read there in Hebrews, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of living, I did say living, consuming fire. You don't want to mess with him because you will do it to your own hurt. Yes, verse 24 saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, Eloah hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe Eloah that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain night. And we see that in chapter 28. But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country and sounded and found it twenty fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it fifteen fathoms. Then, fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea, under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship. In other words, they pretended that they were going to make a way by which they could save the ship, but what they were really trying to do was save their own skin. Shalom said to the centurion and to the soldiers, and this is the theme of the messages I'll be delivering, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. This is the ship. There's lots of ships in the sea of the world. Most of them are sinking. Yes. But this ship is not going to sink. As long as we don't kill it. And there's 16 ways. Sundry and diverse ways. In which you can sink. The boat that Yahweh intends should remain afloat. Not you. I don't think anybody here is going to do that. But we know because of what the scripture tells us. In fact, let's just look at a couple of scriptures. Turn with me to 2 Thessalonians. Let's start there. Second Thessalonians. So was speaking by revelation. He's speaking by way of doctrine. He's speaking by way of exhortation, but in this case, he's here, he's speaking by way of revelation. And he's saying in verse 1 of chapter 2, We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Master, Yeshua the Messiah, and by our gathering together to him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Messiah is at hand. You know, I don't remember a time ever in a presidential election season when I heard so many people express to me that they're fearful. And I'm talking about people who have no particular bent toward the spiritual economies. I'm talking about natural, carnal people. That are afraid. Even they know something is wrong. Yes. That something is not right. And people are afraid. I'm reading this to us tonight. That we can be of good comfort and cheer. What did the apostle say here? That you be not soon shaken in mind. Or be troubled. Neither by spirit. Nor by the media. 
No, it says by the word, but by the media as well. Nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Messiah is at hand. I'm hearing people talk about the end of the age. I'm hearing people talk about the great tribulation. I'm hearing people talk about the rapture. I'm hearing people talk about making a way of escape for themselves. I'm hearing about people becoming preppers. My own son is becoming a prepper. I'm hearing people talk about not being wasteful, but saving. You see trouble everywhere. Hundreds of thousands of vehicles being recalled. As my client, my senior companion client says, it's an everyday issue. Airplane parts falling out of the sky. Strikes, people demanding more money. Prediction of shortages, like during COVID, for example. I've already heard about oh, uh, food being tainted, even cattle feed being tainted, dog food becoming tainted. And then people look at Florida. My companion, my senior companion client, by the way, hails from Sarasota, Florida. So he's very keenly interested because he lived there for 30 years. Three hurricanes, bang, bang, bang. Right? Donna, Helene, Milton, tropical storms, all these commotions. You know, the scripture talks about famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. Let me give you an exegesis of that word earthquakes, commotions, wars, rumors of wars. United States of America on the cusp, perhaps, of another international, well, there is already an international conflict. And some are saying, how long are Russia and China going to be at advance? They are waiting, from what I'm hearing, for the collapse of this the greatest nation in the Western Hemisphere. Do not be afraid of sudden fear, the scripture says. And then there will be some who will come along and stand behind the sacred desk, and I'm not one of them, by the way, who will preach peace and safety. That's the message of the Antichrist, the Anti-Messiah. Beware, then, sudden destruction. Every day is the day on the which we need to behold our salvation. Now is the time accepted. And you say, maybe you would, but some will say, I got saved a long time ago. Hallelujah. But the question remains, are you saved today? Because day by day we are being saved. In Colossians chapter 2, Shaul says, as you have therefore received a Mashiach, walk ye in him. In other words, put him on. As you receive his word, put it on like you would clothing apparel. Walk in it. Don't dismiss it. Don't be saying to yourself, I know all about that. No, we know nothing yet as we ought to know about anything concerning his economies. Am I right or wrong about that, Elder David? We know nothing yet as we ought to know about him. There isn't a single person in here, me, myself included, who could say that I have both comprehended and apprehended that for which I've already been apprehended. Oh. If a man could boldly declare, as he did in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, that he had come to visions and revelations, that was not lawful for any man to utter. Who are we to assume that we are his equal? <laughs> we 
We're still striving. And unless you strive lawfully, you'll never attain unto the masteries. And even he said, I don't count myself to apprehend it, or have attained, or made already perfect, but I follow after. And that's exactly what we must do. And let me tell you something. The day is come when we need to pursue a little bit more rapidly than we have in time past. It's not time to be complacent. Oh, let me read on here. Verse 3 of 2 Thessalonians 2. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Please notice the process and order here, because with Yahweh there's always process and order. A falling away will occur and will precede the Son of Man being revealed. The falling away must occur. Now people are saying, I look at the institutional church in the continent of Europe and what I am seeing is that there are churches being closed, they're becoming museums, they're becoming mosques. In Europe. Here in the United States too. I've been rather appalled as I, I don't travel as much as I used to, but when I was on the weekly trailer route, you know, we drove 800 miles every week. For 18 years I did that, my wife as well. We saw lots of churches closing. It was kind of saddening to me because I'm thinking, what is it? This is one of the things that I'm going to be bringing up. I'll just tell you what it is now. One of the ways in which you kill an assembly is to meet less frequently. One of the things that I've noticed, and I'll just get into it since I introduced it to you. As I have traveled about some of these rural country churches, for example, They'll have a sign by the road, usually a gravel road. You probably know what I'm talking about. You've probably seen it yourself. And they'll list the times and days of their services. Sunday morning, Sunday evening, midweek service. And what's, uh, what I have discovered is that someone has taken whitewash and they've washed out the Wednesday evening service. They've washed out the Sunday evening service. Let me tell you what needs to occur. You know, and I'm kind of burdened about it. Don't really know what to do about it. But instead of meeting less frequently, we need to meet more frequently. Do you know why that is? Because a two-fold and three-fold cord is not easily broken. Because I cannot and I am not, I cannot and I am not, as well acquainted with my brothers and sisters as I ought to be. And the reason? Because I don't have much communication or contact with them. Except for on the Sabbath. You understand what I'm saying? We've kind of bandied that out a little bit, about a little bit. Maybe we ought to have a midweek service. Yeah, maybe we should. Maybe we ought to do a lot more than what we're doing. Maybe what we ought to do when we are in Sabbath services together is to remember it is the day that is set apart. Speaking for me too. Because you can get sucked in so easily. It's a lot more difficult to walk the straight and narrow like you're on a tightrope as opposed to having a broad way on which you've got a little bit more latitude. And I'm going to tell you something about broad ways. There are more detours on the broad way that leads to destruction. On the narrow way, it is straight. S-T-R-A-I-T. By the way, let me exegete that for you. It's not the same word as S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T. This way is fraught with tribulation. And that's what the word straight means. S-T-R-A-I-T. He that lives, they that live righteously will suffer what? Persecution. Shaul in Acts chapter 14, I believe it is, exhorted the disciples at Antioch. And he said, he concludes that we must with much tribulation enter into the kingdom of Alpha. Have you got trouble? 
Have you had trouble? Do you have trouble? Trouble abides you. My son came over yesterday. I asked him, son, I said, would it be all right dad preach to you a little bit? With a smile on my face. He's always glad to hear what I'm saying. Has never refuted it. He said, sometimes he'll even ask a question. I'm trying to engage him because I have a burden for him. I was recalling something that I had read that Brother Lucas had written. He had preached a series of six messages on why suffering, wrote a booklet on that topic. I'd invite you to read that booklet. Suffering is good for you. Nobody wants it. And I was telling my son, I said, do you know why suffering is good for you? Well, he didn't have a clue. You know why he didn't have a clue? Because he won't hear it from a first day pulpit. I never got it from a first day pulpit. I never preached it from a first day pulpit. I told him, like I've told you, miners dig deep. Because the years so you hear it. Yes, and if you're not willing to study this book thoroughly and to show yourself approved of him as a result of, as an outcome of being diligent to study, you're not going to get too much. You'll get a superficial reading of the word like everybody else. But you won't get the length and the breadth and the depth and the height. You'll never come to his fullness. And so, to encapsulate briefly what the brother spoke to us, I said, suffering is good for you because number one, According to what it says in 1 Peter 4, chapter 1, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, 1 Peter 4, 1. He that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Do you know that suffering oftentimes precedes awaking to righteousness? You'll get to the place, and well, if I wouldn't have such bad luck, I wouldn't have any bad luck, I wouldn't have any at all. You'll get to be thinking, you know, what is all this coming my way? Maybe you're in the wrong lane. And maybe it'll occur to you. Shaul experienced something on the road to Damascus. He suffered. And I'm going to tell you something. I believe, from what I understand of the word, he talks about the thorn in the flesh. I'll tell you what I think it was. Because of other evidences that he wrote in the book of Galatians. You see how large a letter I wrote to you. Well, he wasn't talking about the volume of the text. He was talking, I believe, about the size of his letters. If you had experienced what he experienced in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he talks about being stoned, beaten with rods, not once, but thrice. Left for dead, as a matter of fact. To a man of Yahweh who had this intense desire to preach the word, to go about to all the places. In fact, he said this in Acts chapter 15. He says to Barnabas, let's go into every city where we have preached the word and see how they do. You think he would have a shepherd's heart? Yes, he had a shepherd's heart. Do you think that, you know, I've, I've spoken to you about legacy, you know, I'm thinking about that myself because of my age and because of, you know, being blind in one eye and all that other stuff, you know, and thinking, you know, I'm, you know, if by Yahweh's grace, I am what I am and I'll be what I will be by His grace. But you begin to think about, as you age, begin thinking about restrictions because of physical impairments. You begin thinking about that and you begin thinking about your life and how much of the substance of it you wasted you know you know what I'm talking about some of you aren't that old yet but don't get to the place where you're my age or Elder David's age and say I wish I had done better I knew better I just didn't do better now in a time accepted is the day to behold your salvation so Shaul no doubt had some Grave concerns. You know, he's fighting rice of Timothy. You know, let's just turn it for a moment. For, just turn the page. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, and I thank Messiah Yeshua, our master, who has enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And he talks about this. Who is before a blasphemer and the persecutor 
and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now we, up until you get to 2 Samuel chapter 11, everything was just going well with him until he allowed himself to become beset by the adversary by looking upon another man's wife. And then from then on, everything was downhill. He penned Psalm 51 as a result of what he was experiencing concerning the matter of Bathsheba. And he concluded, my sin is ever before me. Not so much what he'd done with Bathsheba, and how he had perpetrated the murder of her husband, Uriah. But the things that he began to experience in his own family. How one of his sons violated a half-sister. How two of his sons, Absalom and Adoniah, sought to usurp the throne. Later on, well past his passing and going the way of all the earth. How Shlomo himself, in 2 Kings chapter 11, took to himself 700 wives, 300 concubines, built altars to their Elohim, sacrificed his own children by them on their altars. You know, my sin is ever before me. Sin leaves a very long trail. And it's never where you think you left it. It'll come back on you. And people say, well, I didn't think Yahweh would allow that to occur. Let me tell you why he does. But from my own experience. Because it should serve to you as a deterrent from continuing or from embarking in that sin again. When you realize that you're paying the wages that are justly due you for your trespass and transgression. It should serve as a deterrent. You know, I've said this before. His commandments are not grievous. What becomes grievous is my acknowledgement of the trespass of those commandments. And people say, Yeah, but if you confess your sins, you're faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's exegetic to mean to remove, to purge you of all guilt. The guilt's still there. And people say, oh, that's just the devil talking to you. You know, wait a minute. There's a reason why I feel bad after I have transgressed the commandment. And why that feeling bad seems to linger for a time. Because the next time the evil comes around to entice me, to tempt me, to distract me, to draw me away, to seek to overcome me, I am more strengthened to say, get thee behind me, Hasatan. I am more strengthened to say, you have nothing in me and I have nothing in you. Because, you know, when you begin to experience misery, the just do, the just recompense owing to your transgression, it will make you think again before you enter it a second time. That's his, that's his mercy, that's his grace to you. His grace and His mercy and His love, His goodness, leads us to repentance. And it should be a repentance that sticks. You know? So we read here. This is the second thing I want to share with you. Oh, I didn't finish the thing in second this long. I'm falling away. I mentioned to you about what's happening in Europe and what's happening here and what we've observed as we've traveled, you know, country roads and so forth. But I want to tell you, when Shaul wrote these, there wasn't any first day church. He's not talking about a first day church. He's talking about a people to whom he and his disciples delivered the oracles to keep. The oracles to keep. Seventh day Sabbath observance. Dietary laws. The seven Shabbaton. Keeping oneself clear and clean. 
men becoming filled with a set-apart spirit so that they could exude the nine fruit of the spirit instead of the 17 works of the flesh. The oracles to keep. And he himself was a model. He himself was exemplary in word, in behavior, in love, in spirit, in faith, and purity. He writes to Timothy, you know the manner of man I was when I was with you. Emulate me, because I'm a follower of Mashiach. Every one of us ought to be able to say that. You emulate me, because I am a follower of Mashiach. That's not pride. That's glorifying Him because the truth of the matter is you and I are nothing without Him. We were nothing. But you know what? That's kind of like Moshe. Ever studied Moses? He spent the first 40 years of his 120 year life and he died, by the way, 120 years to the day of his nativity. According to what he says in Deuteronomy. Spent the first 40 years of his life in Pharaoh's palace learning and discovering that he was a somebody. But after he slew the Egyptian and had to flee to Midian, he spent the next 40 years of life, his life learning that he was a nobody. He was a persona non grata. A person out of favor with Pharaoh. So when he returns to Sinai, to the burning bush, and he hears this voice coming from the burning bush, which we believe was the pre-existent Mashiach speaking to him, beckoning him, actually commanding him to take his shoes off because he was standing on holy ground. And you know what I find is a very good parallel? We read that concerning the hospital too. Yeah. Or you force, you know, remove your shoes because the ground you're standing on is holy ground. <laughs> yeah, the captain of the host. Yeah, the captain of the host. Right. And he learned the last 40 years of his life. You think he was afflicted? Having to deal with a disobedient, gainsaying, recalcitrant people. Ten times and more they tempted Yahweh. He learned that Yahweh could use a nobody and make a somebody out of him. So you can start out thinking you're somewhat Yahweh. You know what this, I love the scriptures. People don't understand the difference between humbling yourself and being abased. There's a difference. And people don't understand. Now, I've heard people pray, and I've probably done this myself. Yahweh, humble me. He ain't going to do it. He commanded you to humble yourself. See, that's, what the, that's the problem people have. They want him, him, to do that which he has commanded them to do. He's not going to humble you. You will either fall upon the rock, and you know what the alternative is? or the rock will fall upon you. Now that's real abasement. Yahweh will abase you. He will even humiliate you, but he won't humble you. Because he's commanded you to humble yourself. And if you refuse it, what does it say there in Proverbs? About a proud man. Pride goes before what? Destruction? And haughty spirit before what? Before a fall. Yeah. So in Timothy, Paul saying the same thing that he said in Thessalonians. Second Timothy, chapter four, verse three. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust. Now they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. And he goes on to say in another place in Timothy, that there will be a falling away. We are seeing it. May I 
submit to you that in this auditory there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve people. Did I not hear you say, sister, you remember a time when there weren't enough seats mm -hmm. to accommodate people for the Feast of Tabernacles? Mm -hmm. I've seen this in the last 12 years myself. Mm -hmm. Where are they? Mm -hmm. So, oh, they're out of the feast sites. Well, yes, perhaps some are. But then I hear reports that this is not a thing that's peculiar to us. Other assemblies experience the same kind of attrition. It's he that endures to the end. That's the reason why. You know, when you come into assembly, there should be there should be one thing that you're desiring to have. Me too. That those things lacking in your faith might become perfected. You should come with an expectation of receiving something. Something that's going to help you. Maybe not just today, but tomorrow. Something that you can store up. You know, I've heard people say, and they even said it to me. I didn't get anything out of what he said. Well, that's, I'm so sorry. When he keeps saying the same thing over and over again. Well, I do know. I am very repetitive. And maybe it's because I'm getting to be an old man. Or maybe it's because the people that are hearing me aren't putting it on. You know, I'm going to tell you something that I've discovered about Yahweh. This is like a course. It's like the Bible correspondence course. You start with the foundation, right? Yahweh is a wise master builder, isn't he? He doesn't waste anything. He's a wise master. He starts from the ground and works up. Man wants to start from the top and work to the bottom. Man will build the edifice and then think about the interior decorating afterward. Yahweh doesn't work that way. He works just opposite of women. He wants to decorate your interior first, the core of your being, so that what you exude, what you display on the outside, is fruitfulness. And you can sure tell the difference between a person who is fervent in spirit and zealously affected, but not according to knowledge. Turn with me to Mark chapter 4. I've witnessed this, you've witnessed it. But let's not become a casualty. Mark chapter 4. In Mark chapter 4, the Master is speaking about four types of soil. Sower went out to sow, verse 3, came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth. Immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of the earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up, choked, it, and it yielded no fruit. Other fell on good ground, and it yielded fruit. That sprang up and increased. Some brought forth thirty, some sixty, some a hundred fold. And he said to them, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, that's the problem people have. They don't have ears to hear. Yeah, they do. Huh? Yeah, they do. Yeah. And so now he's talking about this mystery. Because it is a mystery. And that's the way he spoke. And people said, I don't understand why he doesn't speak plainly. Well, let me tell you something. If you've got ears to hear what he says, it is plain to you. He plentifully declares it plainly to you. But how Job expressed it. Plentifully declared the thing to you plainly. But if you got no ears to hear, to you it's going to be a secret. Psalm 25, 14. The secret of Yahweh is to them that fear him. To them he will show his covenant. So if you don't fear Yahweh, you ain't going to get about very much. You'll get a surface reading of the word and that's all you're going to get. But that's not enough to sustain you. It's like eating chocolate candy. How long can you subsist on chocolate? I love chocolate candy. My wife can prepare some good for us. But how long am I going to be able to be sustained on eating gorp? Trail mix. You know what I'm talking about? 
You need listen. They that are of full age are not drinking milk. They are eating strong meat. Whereby they are able to discern good from evil and truth from error. But if you're a baby, you can't digest strong meat. You've got to have milk. And what did Peter say? He says, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may what? Grow thereby. Hallelujah. So then he begins to expound upon the sower. Verse 14. The sower sows the word. And that's the seed. These are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Hasatan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, they immediately receive it with gladness, and will tell all their neighbors about what they heard. Right? But listen to what it says here. But they've got no root in themselves. And so endure for a while, but afterward when affliction, because that's going to occur. You know, if you try to lead somebody to Messiah and say from now on it's going to be a bed of roses, you have just lied. Because that's when your trouble is really going to start. And you know where it's going to start? It's going to start with your family. Yeah. When I was selling insurance, and they told me, because I had to go to a week's insurance school to Trent, Missouri, before they didn't even license me, you know. They said, when you get out in the field, your first clients are going to be your family and your friends. But that's not going to support you much more than about a month. After that, you're going to have to do the hard work, cold calling, knocking on doors, and having people show you where the curb is, or usher you to the edge of their property. I've had, I've had those experiences. If you're in sales, you know what I'm talking about. You know, it's feast or famine, and a lot of the time it is famine. So when you get to make a sale, boy, you're really, you know, but you've got to be careful just because you made $500 commission on that insurance sale. You may go another month without making another sale. So, you know, you have to be very, very discerning and very, very discreet. Yeah. Yeah, these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world and deceit. See, that's what happens. People hear the word, they immediately receive with gladness. But then, you know, the adversary is always there to tempt, to entice. To take that which is forbidden and to make it appear as good, pleasant, and desired. And many, many become casualties because they think they can have the best of two worlds. But it doesn't work that way. You will have to give up the world in order to receive the universe. First time I never said that. You have to give up the world in order to receive, to inherit the universe. Hallelujah. Well, let me wrap this up. Let me see where I'm at here. I really departed from this. <coughs> Except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Yeah. All right, let me just read this to you. I'm going to. I might have to give that again another three or four years. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read these to you. These 16. This is the last page. And I'm going to read it to you. Hopefully without much commentary. Mm -hmm. But if I make commentary, it's all right, right? So I conclude this message enumerating these 16 sundry and diverse ways by which the assembly is crippled from its mission. You know... I don't know whether we have a mission statement. We do have in the beacon, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we do. It's on an inside cover. To preach the truth to the world. To preach the truth to the world. Can we add something to that? I think we can add a lot. <laughs> to perfect those things lacking in your faith. Now that's a mouthful. And that would certainly bear some explanation. What do you mean perfecting those things that are lacking in my faith? Because you don't know anything and you don't believe anything as you ought to believe. You know, the person, <laughs> you hear people say this, they get saved, they get baptized, sprinkled, poured, 
immersed, however the administration of the particular outfit does it, and they think they've arrived. You know what? Twelve years ago, I thought I did too. My wife and I, we thought we have really arrived now. Got hooked up with a man, Glenn Young, down in Winona, Missouri, for eight months, you know, while I was working. You know, of course, I was, I was an independent contractor, so my time was my own, pretty much. On my route, I'd stop at Winona, Missouri, noon, about every noon, every Thursday, and visit with him. He introduced me into the worldwide church deal, you know. That had been. Introduced me to the Sabbath, to the Moedim. Never heard that word before. Never heard that word, Moedim. Oh, I heard about Pentecost. I mean, that's the only one that they observe, right? And they don't even know what its origin is. That's the birthday of the church. That's what we were taught. Had no idea it had something to do with Mount Sinai when Moshe received the book of the covenant to which they three times agreed whatsoever you speak or Yahweh speaks to us that will we do and obey. Completely ignorant. Shared a lot of stuff concerning the Torah. You know Yahweh's got a way, I was telling this brother, you know, the, uh, Dan, that come visit us, you know, on Yom Kippur, boy, wasn't that? I'll tell you what, that was an interesting, wonderful couple. Got to visit with them. And I was telling him, because he was, he was speaking to me about it, passing by our assembly six or seven times and saw the billboard and decided, today we're going to stop. I'm glad he did. They're in Colorado now, keeping Sukkot. But he was just zealously affected some of the things that he was sharing with me. And some of the things he was sharing with you concerning the things that he had discovered, you know, through the years. And he told me that his wife was responsible for him being there. Not being in Kingdom City, Yom Kippur, being in this way. And I remarked to him and says, brother, I says, you know, I don't know you apart from this day. You're from Kentucky. I live in Missouri. You know, he began to share something a little bit of a bio concerning his past and so forth. And I says, you know, one of the things that is so outstanding to me is Yahweh has got this interesting way of connecting people. You couldn't conceive of it. Elder David, 12 years ago you didn't know me from Adam. Well, 12 years ago you did. 13 years ago, you didn't know me from Adam. And I didn't know you. I didn't even know you, Nicole. Didn't know you, Loretta. Both Loretta's. John Turner, first John, I didn't know you either. Didn't know you, Brian. Yahweh has a way of connecting people and making them to become a family in Him. And you know what? We've got a lot of extended family members that we don't know yet. And periodically, he introduces his children to us. Dan and Deborah Hood. I hope we see them again. So, following our 16 sundry ways. Oh, let me finish this mission statement. Perfecting the saints, right out of the scripture, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Messiah, that we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of Elohim, unto a perfect man, unto the stature of the fullness of Messiah. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Beautiful mission statement. So following our 16th century and diverse ways to an assembly, and if you wish, I've got about 20 copies here. You know, just help yourself if you want afterwards. The reason I don't want to distribute these while I'm speaking is I don't want you to listen to me. I don't want you to be listening to me. <laughs> so you can have it afterwards. It's fine. Don't come to your end gatherings. And if you do come, come late with a grouch. Or a grand entry 
that announces your arrival. Two, get to service early so you can take a back seat and make a quick getaway if the proceedings are not to your liking. Uh, you may not believe this, but you know from my vantage point, from Elder David's vantage point, we see everything's going on out here, most everything. <laughs> and we see people slip out the door. We see you when you go out to get a cup of coffee. We see you when you go out to speak to Brother Bob. We see a lot of things. Now that will alter some of our conduct, right? Sure. Move about the auditorium. Make conversation with your pew mate. Or, and I've added this one, place or take phone calls during the service or otherwise play around with your cell phone, tablet, or other device. There's no reason why the assembly should have two signs, not just one, but two signs, at the entrance to the sanctuary or the meeting hall, please turn off your cell phone. My dentist has got a sign by every one of his stations. Please turn off your cell phone. You go to a doctor's office, to a clinic, please turn off your cell phone. Well, I want to tell you something. You certainly want to do it with a dentist. Because you don't want him jumping at your particular ringtone. And I've been in places where you have all these different ringtones going off and it sounds like a menagerie of ringtones. It's not very pretty, is it? Turn your phone off. Or mute it. When you sing, sing loud and out of key and behind everyone else. <laughs> oh, and when the collection plate is passed, Never pay in advance. Wait till you get your money's worth. Then wait a bit longer. <laughs> Let the minister earn his money. Let him do all the work. You know, I, I'm wrong about that. I remember a time when I would run the vacuum cleaner in the church house because you couldn't get anybody else to do it. Well, I mean, after all, they paint the preacher, right? Let him do all the work. Sit back and judge your minister's performance. Now, let me tell you something. I'm going to read you a scripture. I'll make this comment. In James, chapter 1, talking about judges. James is someone to say to us. Verse 22. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass, for he beholds himself and goes his way and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. All right, I think that was not the verse I wanted. I think it was in chapter 4. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Is this it? I think I'm going to just tell you. Now he never called us to be judges. <laughs> he called us to be doers. So if you judge, you're no longer a doer, but you're a judge. And so, you know, he never called us to judge another man, another man's performance. Oh, and be sure to discuss your minister's faults with your fellow congregants and inform visitors of his failing too, lest they should be a long time finding them out. I mean, what a way to increase your attendance, right? You have Dan and Deborah coming in. Right? That brother Reese there, he's awful redundant. You know, we've heard the same thing over and over and over again. You'll get tired of hearing him like we're tired of hearing him. He never says anything new. Never anything to challenge us. That's his fault. One of his faults. He's probably got others too. But we won't get into that now. But if you come back in next week, you'll probably hear some of the same scriptures cited, some of the same anecdotes, you know, so forth and so on. You know what? I don't make any apology for any of that. 
It's not just the musings of an old man either. And the reason I can tell you that is because we find the, ne the, the Nebiim, the prophets themselves, were rehearsing the same thing over and over and over again. In Romans, even Isaiah says, I all day long I hold my hands up before a disobedient and gainsaying people. Give you an example. In John chapter 9, man is born blind, right? Remember him? Now this, I know exactly where it's at. In John chapter 9, you can just see this young man, I'm assuming he was young, he certainly had a father and mother because they they wouldn't even confess up, fess up. Yeah, this is our son, and he was born blind, but let him speak for himself. Listen to the way he says it. This is a, they approach him three times. I'm talking about Jewry. Three times. What did this man say? What did this man do to you that you can see? Well, about the third time now, he's getting a little bit perturbed. <laughs> you would too. Any of us who have raised children get perturbed having to tell our children the same thing over and over and over again. The writer knows what I'm talking about. Listen to what it says here. Verse 27. Let me go to verse 25. He answered and said, Whether Yeshua, he be a sinner or no, I do not know. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Then they said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And answered them, I told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore, would you hear it again? And that's the way it is in preaching. Sometimes we have to hear the thing over and over again because we, are, we soon forget. And the reason we forget is because we are a hearer but not a doer. If you were a doer, it would become not second nature to you but first nature. That's what Yahweh is wanting to cultivate and nurture in us. That His Word becomes first nature. You just default automatically to doing His good pleasure. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to study it. You don't have to defer it until tomorrow, thinking that maybe He will change His mind. You just do it, and you do it when you're told to do it. And in the manner in which He tells you to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Never ever encourage the minister by thanking him for the sermon. If you like a sermon, or if the message ministers to you, soul's needs, or inspires you, keep mum about it. If you don't like the message, tell everybody about it. Many a preacher have been ruined by flattery. Don't let his blood be on your head. I told my son yesterday. Digress, and I tell him things, and he, and he sits there. He doesn't get up to leave. I said, "Son, have you got some place?" No, Dad. I, I, I've got as much time as you want. Boy, that just delights me, you know. So the Scripture says this: Proverbs, let another man praise you, and not you yourself. That's what it says. Let another man praise you, and not you yourself. Now, I'm not saying preachers ought to go out of their way and say, hey, that's a good something, don't you think? No. I'm not going to sidle up to you, wouldn't you think? I'm not going to try to elicit something from you, but I will tell you a command that the Scripture says, and I'm going to just turn there to you, because I want you to see that the Word is saying this, and that John Reese is not saying it. Well, I am saying it, but the Word said it first. Galatians chapter 6. As soon as I can turn the page of this old Bible. Galatians chapter 6, verse 6. That him that is taught in the word communicate to him that teaches in all good things. When one man is honored, we're all supposed to rejoice. Isn't that the way it works? That's the way it's supposed to work.
Yeah. Next one. At every service, ask yourself, what am I getting out of this? What a waste of time. I could have been on the links playing a nine-hole golf. <laughs> what am I getting out of this? I could have been floating down Current River down in Shannon County. Next one. Visit other assemblies about half the time to let the minister know you're not tied to him. Loyalty? There's nothing like being independent, you know. I'll make this comment. When you come into the master, you have just surrendered all your liberties. You know what's like? Every fourth Friday, about every fourth Friday, my wife and I, we go up to Kingdom City and we help Elder Brett and Sister Brett, you know, get the newsletter and all that stuff out. They are very hospitable. He's just discharging what he's supposed to do as an elder. We stay overnight in their home. But my wife and I are not presumptuous, and neither would they be presumptuous that they would say, you're welcome to spend the night in our home, as many nights as you wish. Because when I step over the threshold of their front door, I have surrendered all my liberties. Brother and Sister Brett, I don't rifle through their chest of drawers. I don't presume to go, you know, I don't. They're very hospitable. And I know that if they were coming into my home, they wouldn't rifle through my chest of drawers or open up my closets. You understand what I'm saying? And you know why? Because we are motivated by the same commandment, and that is love works no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. I don't ever expect to hear Elder Brett say to me, you're no longer welcome in my home. I'm not going, and my wife, we're not going to give him reason or occasion to say that. Yeah. Visit other assemblies about half the time. Nothing like being independent. But you surrender. When you walk into the assembly, you have just surrendered your liberties to those who have the oversight ministry there. Meet less frequently. I already mentioned that. Never volunteer for anything. It's better to stay away from work and criticize them who are doing it. You know what I'm talking about. You got that out there in the world. If your assembly, unfortunately, happens to be harmonious, unfortunately, now that's the way I wrote it. Call it apathy or indifference or anything under the sun except for what it is. And if there should be a few fervent and zealous workers in the assembly, make a tremendous protest about the assembly being run by a clique. And the last one, and I'll give you an opportunity, add your own. The 17th one is add your own. Because there's probably other ways in which you can kill an assembly that I didn't think of. These are don'ts. These are not do's. <laughs> but if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves not doing instead of doing. By the way, between now and the next time we meet, turn the light off at the entrance of broad is the way and wide is the gate that leadeth to destruction, lest others should get lost along the, that long way. And that was inspired by Tom Brokaw. Remember, the guy that used to advertise for Motel 6, leave the light on for you. Leave the light on. The light of the glorious evangel of liberty. So that men are drawn. I love what the word of Yahweh says. The master himself said, That man therefore behold your good works, that they may have reason to glorify your Father.